questions feature uh, on the GoToWebinar panel. So at any point, if you have any questions, you can uh, chat the questions to us through there. Uh, Dr. Borden will go through some frequently asked questions, but at the end, I will uh, chime back in and read those questions to Dr. Burden. So if there's something that you uh, are curious about that isn't covered today, just let us know, and I will read those to Dr. Burden. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Burden to talk to us today about glaucoma. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for attending our webinar this afternoon. Uh, our goal today is just to discuss glaucoma a little bit and maybe give you some information about it. And uh, like Brandy said, please don't hesitate to um, you know, ask questions or anything like that because glad to answer anything that we can. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so January is Glaucoma Awareness Month. And the main reason we do this is because there's one factor about glaucoma that's very significant, and that is that it usually does not cause pain. And because of that, we call it the silent thief of sight because most people who have it don't even realize that they do. And uh, it's a big problem because it's the second leading cause of blindness worldwide. And uh, it's unfortunate that people don't know that they have it, but there are ways that you can determine if you have it, and that's what we're going to talk about. So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a group of diseases that damage the optic nerve. And that's the hallmark of any type of glaucoma is that there's damage to the optic nerve. In glaucoma specifically, this damage is caused by high pressure. And the high pressure is due to buildup of fluid inside the eye. Normally the fluid has collector channels that it circulates through and the pressure is maintained where it's supposed to be. But occasionally for a couple of different reasons, those canals or drainage channels can block up. And when they do, pressure builds up inside the eye and it can damage the blood vessels and nerves in the back of the eye. And uh, we'll mention this several times during this talk, but the problem with glaucoma is that if the optic nerve is damaged and causes vision loss or blindness, that is permanent because the optic nerve doesn't have any way to regenerate itself. Well, the optic nerve, of course, is a very important thing because it is essentially the wire that connects your brain to your eye. It has over a million fibers in it, and those fibers can be damaged by increased pressure in the eye. There's just a physical way that increased pressure in the eye can push against the nerve and over time can cause that nerve to die. And then next slide, huh? So there's two reasons that this can happen. Overproduction of fluid in the eye can occur, although that's pretty rare. The usual problem with glaucoma is that the eye's drainage system blocks up and fluid just can't move like it's supposed to. Next slide, please. So there's basically two types of glaucoma, and we're gonna go over that here, uh, open angle and angle closure. If you look at this first diagram that's on the left-hand side, where the little blue arrows are, um, the very front of the eye is the cornea. That's that front clear window of the eye. And then the colored part of the eye is the iris that you can see when you look at somebody's eye. The pupil is the opening in the middle, and directly behind the pupil is the lens in the eye. Um, you may have heard from previous talks that uh, the lens is what turns into a cataract in time, but the fluid that is produced in the eye is produced behind the lens. It then comes over the lens where you see that blue arrow. It goes through the pupil, the opening in the iris, and then it goes into collector drainage channels. And so where the angle of the cornea meets the iris, is the area where those drainage channels live. Now, in open angle glaucoma, which is the vast uh, majority of glaucoma that people have, those drainage channels are open, it's just fluid isn't getting to them, usually for genetic reasons. Uh, you know, you're, you're dealt a genetic card deck when you come into this world, and in some individuals, those drainage channels just in time don't work like they're supposed to. With angle closure glaucoma, it's a very different thing. Basically, the iris, that colored part of the eye, moves forward and physically blocks off these drainage channels. And when that happens, the pressure just skyrockets and it becomes a medical emergency. We can also have congenital glaucoma, meaning that you're born with it, or secondary glaucomas. The secondary glaucomas are usually caused by medications or other problems with the eye. So uh, about I think it's probably about 40 or 50 years ago now, they took a large group of people 
and they measured everybody's eye pressure. And based on what they measured, they determined what they thought would be normal. Now, we think of normal eye pressure being 12 to 22 millimeters of mercury. That's how we describe it. Uh, some people even drop the lower end down to eight to 22 millimeters of mercury. But the truth is that every person is unique. And so a big part of what I do as a glaucoma specialist is determine what a person's ideal eye pressure is. And then if it's too high, we lower it. Or if it's below a target pressure, then we just monitor it. Again, we keep saying this, but the, the most important thing to know about glaucoma is that for most individuals, it is completely painless, especially in the early stages. And so you can have it and potentially need to be treated for it, but just not know that it's present. Uh, with open angle glaucoma, some of the late stage symptoms are maybe a mild headache or night vision difficulty. If you have damage to the optic nerve, you can actually wind up with blind spots in your vision. And then most concerning is uh, you can develop tunnel vision from glaucoma. That's in kind of the late stages. An interesting thing about glaucoma is you can lose 50% of your ability to see before you physically notice that you're having a problem with glaucoma. And so that's why, of course, we always try to catch it early. With angle closure glaucoma, it's just a completely different thing altogether. It's caused by the sudden increase in eye pressure. And when that happens, people get very blurry vision. They can get incredibly severe eye pain, nausea and actually vomiting with that as well. Big halos around lights and very, very, very severe headaches. It is not a subtle condition. It causes tremendous pain in the eye. And the difficult thing about angle closure is when the pressure skyrockets like that, we frequently have a very limited amount of time to get to that person and perform emergency surgery to fix them. So there are certain ways that the eye looks in a person that is prone to get this type of glaucoma. And so again, that's a reason that we try to do examinations on folks and determine if they have a problem. <clears throat> so anyone can get glaucoma. There is nobody who is immune to it. And so how can you know? Well, it's really straightforward. Routine eye exams, which everybody should be getting anyway for other reasons of eye health, are the way that we do early detection and can then treat patients. And it's estimated that around 3 million Americans have glaucoma, but only about 1.5 million, half of those folks, know they actually have it. There are many risk factors for glaucoma, but some of the big ones are a family history of glaucoma. If you have a first degree relative, meaning a parent or a sibling that has glaucoma, you have a 10% increased risk of getting glaucoma yourself. Individuals over the age of 60 are more at risk. And actually, if uh, you're in the population that is 80 years old or older, there's a 20% um, incidence of glaucoma. So that means one in five people who are over 80 have glaucoma. Uh, diabetes affects everything in the body and the eye is included in that. And so folks with diabetes have a greater chance of getting glaucoma. And then certain populations are more susceptible. So African-Americans over the age of 40, which is very young if you think about it, um, are more susceptible to glaucoma. And individuals of Hispanic origin are also uh, much more at risk for glaucoma. Now the treatment for glaucoma is pretty straightforward. Uh, we start first with medicated eye drops and there are six different classes of eye drops. So lots of different options to try either individually or in combination to get um, the eye pressure down. And the vast majority of people with glaucoma are easily treated just with eye drops. Now, we also have pills, oral medications, one in particular, that can bring the eye pressure down, but it has a host of pretty severe side effects. And so it is never used as a drug to treat uh, glaucoma routinely. It is used emergently when we have to get the pressure down for short periods of time. Now, if medications don't take care of things, then of course the next step is going to be surgery. And so the first one we try is laser surgeries. So selective laser trabeculoplasty is a surgery that specifically treats the drainage channels in the eye to try to increase um, outflow of fluid. And if that doesn't work, then we put in drainage tubes, which are physical devices that are sewn to the eye, a type of shunt to remove fluid or do a thing called a trabeculectomy, which is a procedure where we make an opening in the eye 
underneath the tissue to try to get fluid to flow as well. Individuals who are at risk of developing angle closure glaucoma, and that's the one where the iris pushes too far forward and closes things off, we treat with a thing called a laser peripheral iridotomy, which simply is a procedure with a laser to make a small opening in the iris so the fluid can flow like it's supposed to. <clears throat> Another whole class of things that we have now, and these are only something we've had for a couple of years, very exciting stuff, are minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, MIGS for short. And so if you look at this diagram and you start over on the right side, there's a thing called the eye stent, and then there's an eye stent inject, and then there's the hydrous microstent. And if you look where the little lines point from those images down to the eye, you'll see again where the cornea, that front clear window, hits the iris, the colored part, and there's this brown band. So that brown band goes 360 degrees around your eye. It's called the trabecular meshwork, and it's the meshwork that flu the fluid flows out of the eye from. So if it's blocked up, we put these stents in it, almost like people have stents put in their heart to help flow. Well, these stents help the flow of the fluid to leave the eye. On the uh, far left-hand side is a device called a Zen gel stent, and uh, it's a very, very effective way of lowering the eye pressure because a little tube goes into the front of the eye, through the eye wall, and then underneath the tissue on the outside to safely let fluid out. It's a very effective treatment. Uh, usually gets pressure down to about 15, frequently on no drops. So it's one of our go-to procedures um, when the pressure gets beyond something I can control with medication. Okay, so uh, you know there are some questions that are frequently asked, and so we're just going to run over, uh, or rather go over some of those really quickly, and then take any questions you guys might have. So, can I really go blind from glaucoma? Absolutely. Um, untreated glaucoma, if it is untreated um, for too long, can result in blindness. Um, that is very, very rare in the modern world today. Um, because most permanent vision loss can be prevented, and again, the vast majority of people never need surgery. They just need medications to drop their pressure. And again, I know we're kind of beating this into the ground, but regular eye exams are the key. So any, any individual over 50 um, should have a routine annual eye exam to check for things. And then of course, if anything is found that's concerning, they need to be seen even more frequently. Um, how does an eye doctor check for glaucoma? Well, um, glaucoma in some ways is very simple. It's completely um, dependent on the pressure in the eye. If the eye pressure is too high, we have to get it down. It's just that simple. Um, and there are two main ways that we do it. If you look at the bottom of the screen, on the left-hand side, there's a thing called a tono pin. And you may have had this done before. It's just a little device that we use to gently touch a numbed up eye to get the pressure. And it is a very good screening tool. But if we want to be very, very accurate, we use a thing called a Goldman Applination Tonometer. And it's this little device on the uh, right-hand side. And you may uh, have uh, had that done before. We put a dye in the eye, and then we use a really bright blue light to measure the pressure. And that is the most accurate way that we know of currently uh, to measure the pressure. Will I have to use eye drops forever? Well, possibly. Um, if someone comes in and they do have an elevated pressure, the only way to treat the glaucoma is to get the pressure down. And so it is possible, of course, to need glasses, or rather, I'm sorry, drops forever. Uh, one thing that can kind of change that is uh, just simply having cataract surgery can frequently drop the eye pressure. So some individuals uh, who have eye surgery done, uh, their pressure will drop to the point they don't need uh, drops anymore because their pressure has stabilized. Uh, same thing if we do those stents or some of those other surgical procedures during cataract surgery, that is the most common way that we can get folks off their drops. Is there any way to prevent glaucoma? Unfortunately, no. Um, we do believe that having a healthy lifestyle helps, and specifically aerobic exercise like running or even walking, jogging, whatever, uh, we believe that this causes increased blood flow to the optic nerve, and we think that is a protective effect. So some individuals even believe that aerobic exercise that really gets your heart pumping and such like that is almost as good as using a drop to drop your eye pressure. Is there a cure for glaucoma? Uh, not yet. There's a tremendous amount of research that's going on 
uh, to help us try to defeat glaucoma. But right now, the only way to really effectively treat it is to drop the pressure, either using Medicaid eye drops or the surgical um, methods that we discussed earlier. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to go over. I'd be delighted to take anybody's questions. All right, so I'm going ahead and opening up the a question pane here. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and chat those now. I'll keep an eye on that. Give everybody a second here. And then just to let everybody know, uh, we will actually make this recording available uh, after. Um, we'll probably send it out Monday via email. So if anybody wants to rewatch this or share with a family member who might have glaucoma, we'll make that available to you. Um, so watch your email. Uh, let's see. Are there any questions today? Looks maybe Dr. Burton covered it. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> normal pressure is 12 to 20 plus. What if your pressure is less than 12, but you're still diagnosed with glaucoma? That's a great question. So um, glaucoma is really in some ways broken down even further. And so you can have what's called normal pressure glaucoma. And that's you know the folks um, whose pressure is under 21, or then you can have glaucoma where the pressure is higher than say 21 or 22. So with, with low pressure glaucoma, even though the pressures are down to maybe even 12 or 10, um, the people still have progression of their glaucoma. And we think that that's probably due to some other pathologic process that we just don't know about. But the bottom line with those folks is that the treatment's the same. Even if someone comes in with a pressure of 10, which is very low, we try to get those pressures even lower. Um, uh, it's very difficult to get the pressure uh, lower than about eight to 10 without some pretty significant surgery. And then you run into the problem that you don't wanna have the eye pressure too low because if the eye pressure is too low, the eye will also not function correctly. So it's sometimes kind of a delicate balancing act. Perfect. Uh, do the optic nerve cells die? And if they do, um, does it endanger the cells around them? So a, a good way to think about the optic nerve is that it is just a whole bunch of little wires bundled together. And so uh, the increased pressure can damage individual fibers of that nerve. And that's how we begin to get defects in the visual field. And so we frequently do a thing called a visual field test to try to find those defects. If those fibers die, they're gone for good. And there is no way to regenerate them at this point. There's a lot of stem cell research going on to uh, try to figure out ways to revitalize the nerve or make the nerve re regrow. But uh, currently, if those nerve fibers are damaged, uh, it, it's a permanent thing. It doesn't really affect the tissue around the optic nerve. So it's primarily just the nerve that uh, has a problem. Is neurovas the same as angular? So neovascular glaucoma is basically a type of glaucoma that happens when blood vessels grow where they're not supposed to. So if an individual has diabetes, one of the things that can happen in the eye is that the eye on a kind of a, a molecular level starves for oxygen. Um, and what the eye does then is grow new blood vessels because your eye, just like the rest of your body, has these miraculous ways that it tries to fix itself. Well, unfortunately, these blood vessels can grow into that drainage channel where the cornea meets the iris. And if that's the case, they can form a membrane and no fluid can get through. So when someone has neovascular glaucoma, it has actually blocked the angle, even though the angle is still open. And the way we treat that is usually with tubes. Uh, we just bypass the whole drainage system altogether to get fluid to leave the eye. Okay, a bunch of good questions just came in, Dr. Burton, so I'm going to right. tackle these. Um, all right, so one of them is, there's actually a, a couple um, that are in their 60s uh, that both have been diagnosed with glaucoma, and they're curious if living at altitude affects pressure. That is a great question because you would think it would, right? Um, but actually it doesn't. The eye is a very isolated organ within the body and um, the pressure in the eye regulates itself. So even if you're flying or you're going you know, up a uh, high mountain hiking, the, the, the pressure in the eye actually modifies itself very quickly in response to the outside air pressure. Uh, so regardless of where you are, the eye will just auto-regulate is what we call it. 
Okay, and this is um, a little bit of a one-off, but is the visual field test part of my annual eye exam? So we only do a visual field test if somebody has something that makes us think they might have glaucoma. So if a person comes in with a high pressure, absolutely, we're going to do that. If somebody comes in and we take a look at the nerve physically with a lens, take a look at the nerve and the nerve looks abnormal, we get a visual field. And then if we uh, wind up scanning the eye, because there are a couple of technologies that allow us to actually physically measure how thick the nerve layer is, very powerful technology. Um, and if that looks like it's thin, then the next step is to do a visual field test. But we don't typically do it unless somebody physically feels they have a problem with their vision or we see something abnormal. So that kind of goes in into this question. How effective would you say the little grid test at regular checkups is for detecting signs of glaucoma? So um, if you're talking about an Amsler grid, which is that little grid that's given to you sometimes, that actually is not for glaucoma. That grid is for looking for macular degeneration. Um, the, the difficulty with trying to measure uh, the visual field in any way other than the machines that we use is that your eye is very good at compensating if there's some type of loss. So you would have to have really, really advanced glaucoma loss before it would ever show up on that grid. Um, and for folks who haven't done a visual field test before, basically it's a bowl-shaped machine that you look into and uh, there's a light that you stare at throughout the entire test and a computer flashes lights in your peripheral vision and you push a button when you see those flashes of light. It sounds super easy, but the machine varies the intensity of those lights from very dim to very bright. It also varies the size of the dot that is flashing. And so it can be a pretty challenging test. Um, I can tell you from experience that visual field tests are the things that most of my patients like the least but it's also the um, absolutely most sensitive way to detect glaucoma. If a parent had glaucoma and I had cataract surgery, is there, is there a reduced risk? So the risk stays 10%. Um, uh, and then that's just a genetically driven thing. So, and that's a risk that you have throughout your life, but can't stress enough that just like almost everything else in the body, the older you get, the greater the chances that something breaks down. And so that's why those routine exams are so important. Uh, does a warm iPad for 20 minutes help drainage? So um, what that does is wonderful things for blocked up oil ducts in your eyelids. It's a great treatment for um, dry eye. But with the eye being such an isolated structure, the warm compresses will neither help nor hurt them inside your eye. Um, I have cloudy floating areas in my eyes occasionally. Is this a symptom of glaucoma? So any type of intermittent kind of short-term fluctuation that you have is typically not caused by glaucoma. So vision that is lost by glaucoma is permanent and anywhere you move your eye, that little blind spot will stay with you. All of us have, um, well, I shouldn't say all of us, but most of us by the time we're over 50 have floaters in the back of the eye and the fluid that's behind the lens. And so that can certainly give you these intermittent little areas that seem to be missing. And then one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that dryness of the eye is a huge problem. 60%, 60 percent of your ability to see clearly is based on a nice smooth tear film on the front of your eye. And it's so dry in Colorado to begin with. And then you mix in the winter and heat and all this other type stuff. And pretty soon you can dry out to the extent that you have just these fluctuations in your vision. It's great sometimes, it's worse other times. You may find that if you blink, it makes it a lot better. If you're having things like that happen, the very first thing to do is actually to use artificial tears three or four times a day to see if that will help. Great, uh, what causes pressure to increase after cataract surgery? Very good question. Um, it can sometimes be that the cataract surgery will trip the mechanism that was present already that was going to cause the pressure to increase in the future. Um, if a surgery is complicated in any way, that can sometimes also affect the drainage system in the eye. But some individuals, their eye just responds to having surgery in an unusual way, and that can include increasing pressure. Uh, do you know the institutions that are doing stem cell research? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, but an internet search would find that for you, I'm sure. 
um, that all of the major centers are doing it. It's just at this point, nothing is you know specific enough or has been shown to be beneficial enough that it's coming across our radars yet. But but I rest assured there's tremendous research in those directions for that and for a whole host of other eye diseases like macular degeneration and everything like that. Great. Um, and then this is kind of a, a, a piggyback on that uh, couple, or the question from the couple. So to clarify, since only 3 million people have glaucoma, statistically doesn't make sense that both of us have been diagnosed with glaucoma, a couple that's 62 years of age. Well, hmm. I would say that statistically you're right, it's a little bit unusual, but nothing changes the fact that folks come into the world either you know, designed to get it or not, I guess is a good way to say it. And so um, you're right, I mean, the, the two of you would have found each other with glaucoma is pretty unusual because uh, just thinking of my own patient population, I don't have a lot of folks where both members of the family have it. It does certainly happen though. Okay, well, that was actually the last question. There was a couple shout outs. Um, oh, there's actually one more that just popped up, but there was a oh. shout out um, to you, Dr. Burton, from a patient, just making sure, um, you know, how you're feeling in the new year. So, oh, good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so does cataract surgery go hand in hand with glaucoma? I have glaucoma and never had uh, cataract surgery. Um, so there, there, there are two separate things that occur in the same organ, I guess is a way to think about it. So glaucoma rarely causes a cataract. Um, if you have you know, significantly high pressure in your eye, say from trauma or something like that, that can actually cause a type of cataract. But they're usually just two different things that occur at the same time. So you know, an eye can have multiple disease processes, you know, because certainly a cataract is a disease process, so is macular degeneration, so is glaucoma. So lots of different things can happen in a single eye, but the two aren't related as far as one causing the other or something like that. Perfect. Well, that was the last question, and I know we're getting short on time here. Um, I just want to uh, thank you uh, for being with us today, Dr. Burden, and thanks, thank you to the audience for uh, joining us and asking such great questions. Uh, again, we'll make this available and send out a link to everybody um, probably early next week. Um, feel free to share it with your friends and family. This is something we want to raise awareness about um, just so um, people can save their sight. Um, again, thank you everyone. And people are telling you thank you to Dr. Burden on the chat here. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your time and everybody have a wonderful weekend. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks.